All right, hello everyone. Today is a, a video lecture. Uh, this class is going to be kind of recapping what we did over the past two days. So first we're going to look at the myths that you explored and the misconceptions that commonly surround evolution. And then we'll take a break and we'll go over what um, uh, the evidence that you examined yesterday and how people can use the evidence that you looked at to study certain aspects of evolution. So as usual, if you see anything in blue, please make sure you take a note on that. Um, anything in red is also pretty important. Uh, pause the pause the video as you need to and uh, and work your way through it like that. All right, so you're going to need that um, the classwork from Tuesday, which was the myths of evolution, so please make sure you take that out. Okay, so first, before we do anything, I want to define kind of a very important word, and that word is niche or niche. I'm not too sure. I can think you can pronounce it both ways. Anyway, a niche is where and how a species fits into its ecosystem. So it's basically how it interacts with all the things that surround it. It includes, but it's not limited to, the habitat that it lives in, what that organism tries to do in the environment. Is it a decomposer? Is it a photosynthesizer? Is it a predator? That kind of thing. Um, and it also takes into account the prey and predator relationships that exist among the other organisms and species in that ecosystem. So it's, it's, it's kind of an all-encompassing term for how something just fits into where it lives. So that's what niche is, and it plays a, pity, a pretty big role in uh, evolution. There's uh, two definitions for the word niche. There's this kind of nice um, uh, evolution one that, that applies to evolution, and then there's also this, which is kind of like a little alcove in a wall where you might put a statue. That's not the one we're talking about. The one we're talking about is kind of like this. By the way, this is an awesome animal. This is called a cuttlefish. It's not an octopus. And just look at how amazing it blends into the environment. That is incredible. That is ridiculous. Okay, here's another cuttlefish. Oh, it's so cool. Look at this thing. It's going to disappear in a second. Just look how it fades. Right. Oh, he got him. Oh, look at that. Sorry. Let's watch that again. Oh, I think I'm just going to have a little, oh, yeah, just sit there. That's good. Oh, and yeet. Oh, okay, all right, here we go. All right, so first, let's review those myths. Um, so the misconception, the first misconception, the first misconception that we looked at is that evolution is, quote, unquote, just a theory. So in everyday use, that word theory means a guess or a hunch or a, a hypothesis, maybe even. But in scientific language, theory, sometimes with a capital T, means more like a body of knowledge. It's a, it's a collection of observations and facts and laws and principles that are used to explain a general phenomenon or a general observation. So it's, it's a much more grand term when, um, when we use things like germ theory or the theory of gravity or the theory of evolution. So when people say that the th when people use the term theory of evolution, they're referring to the entire collection of evidence and uh, irrefutable facts that show that evolution has occurred. It's not just a guess or just something that we're working on. By the way, bonus points if any of you can uh, tell me what movie this is from. Not the quote, but this character. Um, the second misconception that we looked at was that humans evolved from monkeys. So that's a phrase that's used a lot, uh, that if we evolved from monkeys, where, uh, where are all the animals that are in between? And are we really just grown up monkeys? Um, but that's not the way that we should be looking at it. Chimpanzees and bonobos are the closest living relatives to us, to Homo sapiens, and we evolved from the same ancestor about five to eight million years ago, and then we have settled into our own niches. Um, our niche happens to be one where, where we rule because of our intelligence. Chimpanzees have found their own niche in forests and other um, uh, jungle kind of habitats. So this picture, while it's used a lot to, to showcase evolution, I really don't like it because this animal is very closely related to a chimpanzee and it's obviously learning how to walk upright and become a human. Um, and it, it kind of gives the impression that we are... Uh, we evolved from a chimpanzee, but really the common chimp didn't look very much like the, um, the common ancestor that we had five to eight million years ago. So the truth, the best way to, to approach this kind of, uh, this aspect of evolution is that humans evolved alongside monkeys and apes and other uh, uh, primates. Uh, as a better picture to illustrate that point, apes, monkeys, and, and humans are more like evolutionary cousins. Um, so here are humans and bonobos and chimpanzees and then gorillas. So you can see how closely it is that we, we split. So if you go follow this line to about eight, five, 
six, seven, eight million years ago, that's when that split occurred between our common ancestor. We're then pretty closely related to gorillas. And then after that, orangutans, and then gibbons, and then old world monkeys. Uh, just as a point of fact, if you case, in case you're wondering, the difference, one way to tell the difference really quickly between an ape and a monkey is that an ape has no tail and monkeys have tails. Um, so expanding on this little tree of life here, you can kind of apply that to every single living species and understand that we all have a common ancestor if you go back far enough. So here are the mammals. These are all the different branches on the tree of life. This is the mammal branch, the bird branch, the reptiles. Now, this isn't at all comprehensive, but it kind of does a neat illustration of how um, everything can get tied back to a common ancestor uh, a long, long time ago, um, which would be kind of a single-celled organism. Oh, this is just a cool picture. This is Gigantopithecus blackie. This huge primate went extinct about 100,000 years ago, and it's massive. It's this huge, huge, massive gorilla. How cool is that? Okay, the next myth that you guys looked at was evolution's pur was that evolution's purpose is to make the best animal. So this is kind of tricky to to unpack. Um, because it does seem like evolution is guiding species towards becoming the best that they can be. But that's not exactly, it's not, it's, it's nuanced, it's more nuanced than that. It's more like evolution is just guiding a species to fill a hole. It's not like it's trying to be the best that it can be, it's just trying to be, it's just trying to survive. All you're trying to do is fill that niche, and if the niche changes, then you gotta slightly change a little bit to fill that new niche, and that new, um, that new habitat that you need to, to survive in. So it's not like we're trying to make the best animal. Um, for example, uh, there's a lot of design flaws in the human body. One of the big ones is that our eating tube is the same one as our breathing tube. We need to breathe all the time. We can't store oxygen, which again might be another design flaw, but because we need to have a constant supply of oxygen, it's kind of silly that just a single flap of skin called that epiglottis, which is right here, that epiglottis pretty much saves your life on a daily basis because it closes whenever you swallow. So when you swallow food, that flap closes. The air tube is in front of that, and the, the most direct path would be for food to fall down, fall down that air tube and, and get into your lungs. But every time you swallow, this flap of, uh, of skin, or not skin, but this flap of tissue closes, and the food goes down the correct pipe. Um, that's a big design flaw. That's a horrible, horrible combination of two very important tubes. Uh, and there's there's other ones as well. Our wisdom teeth are not exactly useful anymore. There's a lot of stuff that, that is not perfect about the human body. Um, you guys read this metaphor yesterday about a puddle. I think it does a good job of, sh of kind of uh, discussing this myth, um, that evolution's purpose is to make the best animal. Uh, so if you think of the puddle as something that's trying, the water is something that's trying to uh, evolve, and the way that it flows is is the process of evolution, then all of these little holes in the ground would create the best puddle. But there's really no such thing as a best puddle, um, just a puddle that happens to fit the hole perfectly. So if your bucket of water is poured into the ground, not all that water is going to go into the best puddle. There's no such thing. It's just going to flow downhill and settle in different environments. And that's very much what evolution is trying to do. You're just trying to settle into an environment where you'll find some stability. Uh, misconceptions. Okay, the other one that we looked at was that evolution is... Oh, this is the one that we didn't actually get to. So this is the one myth that I took out of that little uh, rotation. This is that evolution is no longer occurring in humans. Um, but that's not true. We are actually uh, re evolving, uh, or we are continuing to evolve. It's just such a slow process that it's, it's hard to see. Um, so becoming more lactose tolerant is something that's happened fairly recently. A lot of people still are lactose intolerant, but many of us are able to digest the, the lactose sugar that's found in milk way into adulthood, whereas before that ability was lost pretty much after we stopped nursing um, at a young age. We are also, due to the fact that we're, we're a much more carbohydrate-heavy uh, society as a result of agriculture, um, we're able to uh, increase our ability to, or we're able to digest larger quantities of carbohydrates due to the increase of the AMY1 gene um, in the general population. Uh, some other examples might be uh, populations that live in high environments like Tibet, Peru, Nepal, they all have better um, lung capacity for low oxygen environments when you're up at those high altitudes. Uh, some of us are being born without wisdom teeth at all, and so we don't have to have them removed. A lot of us have to have those wisdom teeth removed because as they come in 
during early, early adolescence, they start to impact our jaw and push other teeth out of the way. Um, our jaws, our mandibles are getting smaller, and so those wisdom teeth no longer fit. Blue eyes is another kind of cool uh, example. About 10,000 years ago, that was a mutation, um, and now it's increased in the gene frequency in the, in the uh, population. So another, the, the best way to look at this is that all species continue to evolve. They do so at different rates, depending on selective pressures and other things like how often do they reproduce, how long does it take to reproduce, uh, how big is the litter size when, they're when, when um, the offspring are born. There's a lot of things that go into rates of evolution. If you wanted to learn more about this for maybe like a level four understanding, you'll want to look at the red queen hypothesis. It's pretty interesting. Okay, uh, the last misconception that you're looking at is that animals try to adapt to their surroundings to increase their individual chances of survival. So this is tricky because no individual is trying to adapt. There's no, uh, they, they cannot genetically change their DNA, right? They can't modify, they can modify their behavior based on phenotypes that they've inherited, but that's it. They can't change their alleles midlife. Um, you can have a mutation, but again, try as you might, you cannot force a mutation upon yourself just by trying to get one. Um, the truth is more that a species, so you have to think of it in terms of like the broader species, can adapt very slowly, but again, it's not really trying to. It's not like you're actually, actually trying to, because the only way that adaptations and, and uh, evolution occurs is through mutations, and there's nothing that a species can do to... to uh, to create a mutation that would be favorable. They're all random. The whole concept of mutation is very random. Even if you can expose yourself to lots of mutagens and increase it, the likelihood that you will get a mutation, you don't know how that mutation is going to affect your DNA. So mutations, which are the, the cornerstone, the building block of evolution, that's a very random process. And there's nothing that a species can do to try to mutate themselves in the way that they want to be mutated. All they can do is adapt slowly by responding to various pressures and selecting the best phenotypes that deal with those pressures and they might be processed differently kind of like in the turkey games um, that we did um, as future generations inherit those 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 phenotypes all right so that was it for the myths of evolution what i want to do now is spend a little bit of time going over um, things that scientists use to study evolution so this would be the work from yesterday um, there was four stations that you looked at, and we're going to go over each of those four things. You examined that evidence, and then you came up with a name to describe that overall theme, but now I'll actually give you the, the, the terms that are used to describe them as well. So this first one is called the fossil record. Um, probably a lot of you guys got that. Uh, we use fossils as a way to date um, certain events and to show change to, uh, uh, to species over time. One cool thing about rock strata is that um, it provides a way to relative date. So for example, all of the fossils found in this layer would be younger than the fossils found in this dark layer, which would in turn be younger found than the fossils uh, beneath this white line and down here lower in the rock strata. This white line, by the way, is called the KT boundary, and it's thought to be the extinction event of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. This white powder is the dust that settled from that huge asteroid impact that put a lot of uh, uh, debris into the air. All right, so the fossil record shows changes to organisms over time. That's what this kind of cartoonish picture was trying to illustrate. I know a lot of you guys thought that that was actually rocks, but these are supposed to be shells or some kind of organism, just some make-believe living thing that if you dig down deep enough, you would find this version of it, and then a little bit shallower in the rock strato, you, strato, you would find this version, and then closer up, you'd find this, and then near the surface, you might find this one, and that's supposed to show you that there's change to this overall, this base organism over time, it's adapted and evolved and, and grown in different ways. Um, enough evidence shows some drastic changes. So from rock, from the rock strata and from the fossil record, we've, we, we've learned that mammals uh, came from a group of reptiles, reptiles came from amphibians, amphibians came from fish, and that birds have evolved from dinosaurs. So the, the fossil record is probably the strongest tool that we can have to study evolution. Um, this is kind of dolphins that have evolved. Uh, they came from a land-dwelling animal, and then they went back into the sea as the continents separated. Uh, we also had this picture of skulls over time, so this would be uh, about three and a half million years ago. This is Australopithecus. Uh, this is kind of what humans weigh. Uh, let's see, where are we? 
Um, yeah, I guess this is kind of the original one of the common ancestors that eventually evolved into gorillas and chimpanzees and humans. Here's Homo neanderthalus. This group is extinct, but this is probably one of our closest living relatives. And you can see how similar it is to the Homo sapiens skull. It's just much more robust. And that's your classical looking caveman person. Uh, let's see. Sometimes you can use these, like, um, I don't know what you would call these, these tree of life, maybe, fossil record branches. There's probably a name for them. And a lot of times there's gaps in them. And the more gaps you have, the less information you know about it. But as a fossil record, um, gets updated, you can fill in the missing links. All right, so our next station was this concept called descent with modification in modern species. And so this uh, basically shows that current species often share similar features. This suggests that those traits were inherited from a common ancestor. So if you look at all of the forearms of a lot of common or, or a lot of current living animals, they all have extremely similar or analogous structures. One upper arm bone in the humerus, uh, two forearm bones, which would be your ulna and your radius, and then usually five, uh, some carpals and then, and then five phalanges. So this is common across animals, not just in mammals, but whales, fish, bats, frogs, lizards, all that kind of stuff. And so what this means is that, or what this suggests is that all these animals at some point came from an ancestor that had these things. And this design worked really well, so it stayed in shape, but it has been modified to fit new situations. For the bird, the, the bones are hollower, and the, the, they're fused together because they don't need that digitation of the phalanges. A bat's phalanges have spread out so that it can have a lot of surface area over that wing. A whale's bones are very robust to uh, have strong flippers to push a lot of water. So um, they're specialized, but they all seem to have come from the same common ancestor. Uh, you can also see this with um, uh, human embryos, or all species embryos. So all these embryos here, fish, reptile, birds, and humans, when they start off, they all have these gill slits, and they all have these tails. So if you look at embryos of different animals, they all look very similar. So let's do that here. You can kind of see this is the starting stage for a lot of embryos. Um, let's try to guess at what they are. So any ideas yet? They're still looking pretty similar, with their tails and their gill slits. Let's keep going. All right, now you might be able to guess what's happening. We have a fish here. This could be maybe a salamander. This is definitely a turtle of some kind. Um, maybe a pig in there. I'm not too sure. And that's what they would look like. So fish, salamander, tortoise, a chick, hog, a calf, rabbit, and human. Um, so we all, when we're developing, start off very similar. And then as we develop in the womb, we are that, that modification that kicked in that turns us into different species, those genes turn on epigenetically, and we become uh, our own individual organism. All right, the third station. Uh, this is called vestigial structures. A lot of you called it unnecessary traits, and that's a definitely a good term for them. Vestigial structures is a biological structure that has been inherited from an ancestor, but has basically become useless, which is what you guys pulled out. So pythons have the remnants of hind leg bones, even though snakes don't have legs. Humans, um, we have an appendix that is pretty much useless now. We don't use that anymore. Uh, whales have tail bones and a, a pelvis bone. These, uh, there's something called a blind rat. So they have skin that's because they live in caves and dark areas where they're, they're not, pretty much don't need to see anything. Uh, their eyes have been covered over with skin, and they can never see anymore. Um, think about why might an ostrich be said to have vestigial structures. What is it about an ostrich that it has that is pretty much useless? Uh, some more ear muscles. You can wiggle your ears, and that's not really useful for humans, but if you were a deer or a cat, you know how they can kind of point their ears and have that directional um, aspect of them to pick up on prey? That would be pretty useful for them, but not so much for us. Our tonsils are useless now. Our tailbone is useless. Uh, our body hair pretty much serves no purpose. Um, but that being said, the hair on our head still does serve a purpose. It doesn't keep us warm, but it's kind of a sexual selection trait. So we can use it to, uh, to entice other members to uh, want to reproduce with us, I guess. Uh, Darwin's point. This is kind of cool. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the purpose of it is on... Uh, on, an, on a primate even, but I know that we still have them, or at least some of, the, some of us have them to some extent. So it's a little point that occurs right here on the inside of your ear. 
you can see it right there as well. So take a moment, look at the person sitting next to you and see if they have a Darwin's point. Um, just as like an aside, this has nothing really to do with evolution, but Q, uh, QWERTY keyboards, which is what we're currently, or what we're used to typing on, these are in a way, these are vestigial. So keyboards were laid out this way because typewriters uh, were the most commonly, oh, I'm sorry, when we use typewriters, this was the most, this was the best configuration because con they, what they would do is they would take letters that were commonly used, like E, A, um, I, I don't know, a lot of the commonly used letters to type, if they were bunched too close together, they would jam up when typing. So they came up with this configuration to avoid those jam ups, and it seems to work out well. Uh, yeah, the layout remains, although it no longer serves the same purpose that it used to. So that's it's in a sense that these are vestigial keyboards. Um, and then the last one we looked at was this concept of geographic distribution of homologous species. So this is where similar species are found in different parts of the globe. A species that ranged in this dark region above would evolve differently as the continents drifted apart and, and took on new environments. Um, but they would still look kind of similar maybe to their ancestral uh, original species. So all of these birds have a very similar profile and similar useless vestigial wings. Um, and they probably all came from a common ancestor that lived in this uh, supercontinent many, many millions of years ago, and as the continents drifted, they evolved somewhat differently to deal with that new habitat. Uh, these are, this is another example of it. Um, fossil, remains of, fossil remains of this animal can be found on so South America and Africa. Um, so that shows that at one point it was living at the same point, uh, in the same region, and then the continents drifted apart. All right, so to tie everything up, Let's talk about what evolution is. We've looked at myths and we've looked at evidence for evolution. Let's specifically design it. Evidence, uh, evolution is the accumulation of changes to a species over time. And it's how species are related through distant ancestors. This is what we study when we're studying evolution. It is not an explanation for how life began. That's something entirely different um, called uh, abio abiogenesis, which is pretty interesting, but it has not to, nothing to do with uh, evolution. Um, and the way that evolution works is there are four main drivers, I guess. The first thing you need is a change. That change can be genetic, it can be a mutation, or it can be a change to the environment, or maybe both. But there needs to be some kind of change that occurs. Um, afterwards, there, there's natural selection, and this is the filtering of the change. Only the best animals are able to survive whatever happens. If enough animals can be natural selected uh, to survive, they'll adapt to whatever change occurred. This is the results of the filtering. And then the long-term uh, results of adaptation is when animals split into different species. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, leave them in the Google Doc. And uh, thank you for listening.